Hi there, I'm Jennifer Molidor, Senior Food Campaigner with the Center for Biological Diversity. Thanks for joining our third panel in the Grazing the Wild series, where we're gonna talk about facts and fiction about grass-fed beef and cattle grazing. I'm super excited for this panel today. Our panelists um, are gonna offer insights that are not usually presented in conversations about cattle um, in the mainstream debates in the United States anyway. And they're gonna bring a lot of nuanced understanding to the complex intersections of issues when it comes to cattle production, including human ecology, culture, and justice. First, some housekeeping. You can watch our other webinars in the series on our YouTube channel. The link is in the chat. We're gonna put a bunch of links in the chat for uh, my helper, my colleague Griselda is going to do that. You can also catch all of our webinars on our Take Extinction Off Your Plate webinar page. And please do remember our brand new grazingfacts.com website, which can answer many of your questions or some of the questions that you might have after this presentation. And we'll take questions at the end. We may not get all of them um, into the conversation, but if we don't, we'll try to continue this on social media. You can find me I'm very active on Twitter. Um, some of our panelists are as well. And we'll, we'll be posting the links. Please do check them out. Um, we're also posting links to our panelists, their books and their articles. Uh, for your reference, I hope that you will check them out. One uh, has a one one of our speakers has a new book out that's awesome. I just finished reading it this week, and I'm going to tell you more about that in a second. But today we're going to talk about what it means to regenerate. When we talk about regenerative farming of food, people mean um, different things by this concept, right? So regenerating soil, regenerating culture, history, the health of the community, the way that we interact with food, nature, and farming. So I want to do that here today as well to regenerate these debates in a way um, about cattle and you know some add some context in history that gives us more meaning and especially consider the roots of regenerative farming overall and our understanding and rooted in justice. So as a broad overview, as I've mentioned before in this series, people in the United States consume four times the global average of beef. In the U.S beef production is a leading source of methane emissions, land use, water use, and pollution. So in terms of the resources that are used, cattle is a very inefficient way to grow food. Most beef is produced in the U.S. by a concentrated feedlot model. So cattle graze for the first part of their lives, all cattle, all grass-fed. And in the United States, most of them are then sent to a feedlot to be fattened up for slaughter. This is not necessarily true for many regions outside the United States where cattle are grazed widely in pastures, forests, and public lands. So our panel today is going to continue the conversation about the impact of cattle production. Uh, we're going to include people in that conversation a little bit more today, uh, and where grass-fed and regenerative beef fit into these solutions to food systems. And as we've discussed before, the claim is that regenerative grazing of cattle is required part of regenerative farming, and that's really where the debate comes in. Um, the idea is that grazing cows sequester carbon, they could build healthy soil, promote biodiversity. But the reality and the limitations and the history and the nuance uh, often comes with something you know, a little bit more complicated. For example, there's trade-offs to some of the benefits. Um, increased methane, for example, can bring increased water pollution, fencing, land use, harm to wildlife, and so on. So these benefits also only come in particular regions, it's much harder to do in the arid west, for example, and they require significantly reduced herds. We'd have to think about consumption as well, most likely. But there's also a human element involved in this that seems almost always left out of the conversations, including migratory workers and slaughterhouses, farms, field workers, farm workers, not to mention the pollution of slaughterhouses, which is almost always left out of these conversations land ownership, violence, displacement, colonization, co-opting of land, and so on. Um, and we'll do a deeper dive into these topics in just a moment. But first, I'm going to introduce all three of our panelists at once. Um, there's links in the chats to some of their articles and books, as I mentioned, and then we're going to start out our conversation. So Dr. Linda Alvarez, our first panelist, she studies violence, migration, comparative politics, and the ways marginalized groups resist dominant structures of power. She holds a PhD in political science and an MS in international relations from Claremont Graduate University, along with an MA in Latin American studies from Cal State Los Angeles. Welcome. Dr. Liz Carlisle is the author of the new book, 
Healing Grounds, Climate Justice, and the Deep Roots of Regenerative Farming. She's also an assistant professor in environmental studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She's um, written several books about regenerative farming and agroecology, if you're interested in this topic, and frequently writes about food and farm policy. She holds a PhD in geography from the University of California at Berkeley, and she's also a wonderful singer. Dr. Rosa Fitzek is a cultural anthropologist at the Institute of Interdisciplinary Research at the University of Puerto Rico. Her work addresses technology, empire, the environment in Latin America, the Caribbean, including the article, Cattle, Capital, and Colonization, that for me sparked the idea of this panel. She holds a PhD in cultural anthropology with an emphasis in Latin American studies from the University of California, Santa Cruz. So thank you all for being here so much for that long worded <laughs> introduction. Um, I'm really excited about our panel today. Linda, I'm gonna start with you. Um, you've written about, and people can check this article out. Um, I think it's on the Food Empowerment Project website. You've written about how food is power and colonization happened in part by controlling access to food and changing how and what people eat and all the cultural heritage loss that's connected to that and everything that goes into food rituals. Can you give us a bit of an overview about how non-native livestock, cows and pigs and sheep, played a part in colonizing the peoples in, in America and the impact that this had on indigenous diets, the legacy that's left? Yes, thank you for having me here today. Excited to be here with you all, my colleagues, and I'm sure uh, my colleagues can speak to this as well. Um, but yes, um, so what I have basically looked at is the area that is Mesoamerica, so Latin, Latin America, Central America. And, um, you know, this story really starts out the way so many do in the destruction that colonization, you know, the havoc that it wreaked wherever it went. And so in this particular region, um, you have the arrival of these animals, right? They were, they're not native. And in my classes, a, a lot of students are surprised to learn that cows are not native to this area and pigs. And, um, and so it's just taken as a given that these animals have always existed here when in fact they have not. And so that's also not to say um, that indigenous uh, groups were completely, you know, vegan or vegetarian, you know, they did incorporate animals um, like deer, rabbits, other types of um, uh, animals that would be native to this area. But there was a lot of obviously farming, uh, right, agriculture that took place. And so um, in this area, the historical uh, significance of the milpa, right, which is the corn, the three sisters, the corn, the squash, and the beans, and this very um, integrated way of growing food was was uh, foundational to food systems. And so when the um, colonization process begins, there's a lot that happens. First of all, there's a destruction of of these systems because of the incorporation of European systems, right? So Europeans arrive and they say, um, this food is ultimately what, what we consider famine foods. We wouldn't eat corn and beans and squash and those kinds of things uh, unless we were literally starving. And so um, we're not interested in that. What we want to do is we're going to bring our animals over uh, and we're going to also introduce things like wheat and wine and these kinds of things for people to eat. And so when, when that occurs, um, when you bring this mass amount of, of animals you know, onto a, a new, you know, piece of land, there was no structured way to do this, right? Animals were basically left to wander around, graze and eat. And so a lot of that uh, ended up encroaching on indigenous uh, agricultural lands. And so a lot of these communities were actually starved out as animals, you know, were just eating, doing what they're doing. Uh, and there was no consideration placed into protecting in any way these agricultural practices. Um, and then what, what occurs socially as well is that you have this phenomenon of this, of this famine food idea start to uh, really be pushed into society. And so the idea of um, eating meat became associated with status. And so the more meat one could consume, right, the more status you had in society. 
And so that really becomes um, a significant problem because it, it begins to really alter the relationship that people have with food. Um, and so indigenous people in, initially are experiencing the destruction of everything, right? Not just their agricultural systems, but their the land, their their family structures, their systems, right? Their their lives in general, right? The the immense amount of death that occurred um, due to disease, particularly at the beginning of colonization. But then you start with the imposition of European ideas um, in terms of culture, society, and how people should handle themselves. And so the introduction of food as a, um, as a status symbol begins to also affect, as time goes on, right, um, colonized populations, indigenous groups. And so that leads to ultimately, um, you know, so many things, but, you know, this, um, this idea that if you participate in certain types of food, and that's, I don't, I want to be clear that that's not to say that indigenous people completely disappeared the agricultural systems in which, which they were used to. Um, but the social pressure was on, was on eliminating them. And so when you get people now being forced to, and then ultimately embedded in society that the more meat you eat, the higher status or the higher status you can become or the more positions you can engage in, um, then you start to alter the way people also view themselves. And this is, um, I think, very important because when we fast forward to now um, and we start thinking about the ways people think about food, you know, these are actually colonial legacies. It's not just, oh, I, yeah, I grew up you know, I hear a lot um, also with my students, I grew up e eating carne asada, you know, that's what I do. I just eat steak and that's my thing. Um, but these are historical trajectories. And to this day, uh, you know, people associate food, meat particularly with status. And so if you're poor, you don't have access to meat. If you are better off, you have access to meat. And so um, there's a lot that got wrapped up in the colonization process with this idea of status that then leads people to engage in this type of food system versus uh, others or, or, um, or really rely on this in order to move up in society. So um, I, you know, I want to leave some time. I'm sure, like I said, our other colleagues have um, more to say, but I, I think that that's such an important piece because when we think about kind of pulling back on some of these things and changing things, this is a historically entrenched behavior that people link to a lot more than just what am I eating today because it tastes good. It's actually, you know, the way you actually um, conceive of yourself and your position in life is related to what you eat. Thank you so much for adding that context. Did, did anyone else want to respond to that question? I was gonna follow it up with connection to Rosa's work um, about, you know, just connecting what Linda is saying about wealth and status. Rosa, I really, as I said, appreciate your, your article, the full title, Cattle Capital and Colonization, Tracking Creatures in the Anthropocene, In and Out of Human Projects. Um, you write that just as European history of capitalism can't be fully understand, understood without acknowledging its interconnections with indigenous history, human history must also be understood as interconnected with the history of animals. And I think that is in part what Linda was saying as well. Um, so you make these connections between capital and capital, and I find it really interesting. Historically, you noted in this piece that Engels says that livestock is the first private property. Marx argues that enclosing communal agricultural land turned peasants into wage labor. So this, I love this article, it's just super interesting. I wonder if you can give us a little overview um, from your research and your background about the ecological relations and, and how cattle and capitalism are connected. Sure. Um, thank you, Jennifer, um, for the invitation and for the introduction. Um, and I think that what a lot of what I have to say is going to resonate with what Linda was talking about. There are a lot of very interesting points of contact between my work and hers. Um, I came to cattle through my research on Panama, um, where I went to Eastern Panama to study how the construction of a highway was um, impacting the landscape and the forest and um, the relationship of the highway to deforestation. And it was a situation where 
colonists from another part of Panama were coming in and they were um, cutting down the forest and establishing pastures and farmland and displacing indigenous and Afro-descendant people. So I wanted to understand why this was happening and how, and then this led me into this really, really deep dive into the historical literature. And I um, began to explore something that turned into a regional history of cattle in the Americas through the lens of colonialism and capitalism and how these two processes worked and reinforced each other at the same time. So what I would like to do is share um, a couple of snapshots from the Caribbean that helped me understand the situation that I found in Panama and that might be good to think with in other um, parts of the Americas, whether it's in South America or North America. And so this history begins in 1493 when uh, the first cattle that crossed the Atlantic disembarked on the island of Santo Domingo, which is today Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And what happened here was a situation very similar to what Linda described. The cattle, um, because they were used to, in Spain, occupying these um, unenclosed spaces, um, what they found in the Caribbean was also a lot of space. They found grasslands that the Taino peoples had prepared um, and maintained with fire um, as part of their hunting and ecological practices. So the cattle found a lot of space and they were roaming unenclosed. They found a lot of food in the gardens that the Ainos cultivated. And so they had these really favorable conditions for multiplying. And it wasn't long before it, um, there were very, very large herds of wild or feral cattle. And one thing to remember about this is that it's a very, very violent scene because we're talking about warfare against indigenous people. The Spanish were destroying their villages, capturing people and making them mine for gold. And in the middle of this is the, you know, we see the cattle loose, eating, walking and shaping the landscape together with um, many new plant species that also cross the Atlantic. And so the unenclosed herds thrived in places where indigenous people had been displaced and they benefited Spanish colonization here in a number of ways, not only by extending Spanish control uh, geographically, but because uh, when they were rounded up and sold, they were used as capital to establish sugar plantations, to import um, enslaved people from Africa, to work on the plantations and to finance exploration and conquest expeditions to other parts of the Americas. And all of this was because of the resources and the, the wealth that capital that cattle were able to generate, right? And so this is a pattern that I started noticing as I, um, as I was um, researching cattle in the Caribbean, in Mexico, in Central America, and in South America. Um, you notice a pattern in the way cattle aided European expansion throughout the colonial period. They occupied space. They made these spaces that for Europeans, um, they might have considered in hospital, they made them more livable for the Europeans. They destroyed the native environments, they altered them, and they also transformed relations of property because eventually in many places, they allowed the, the presence of cattle allowed colonists to make land claims based on that presence of cattle, right? And, and in Panama, where I do my research, it was, um, not even the cattle, but it was the grass that fed the cattle what allowed the colonists to make these landscapes and uh, to make these land claims and initiate the process with the state to establish that private property. So that's one part of the snapshot that I want to talk about. The other part of the snapshot, I think, is really interesting for helping us move forward and, and think about alternatives to these food systems, to these economic systems that are so violent, right? And so this facet has to do with the way that cattle were important to fugitive landscapes and maroon landscapes that emerged in spaces beyond state control. And so going back to Santo Domingo during the colonial period, the northern part of the island was kind of like this um, un uncivilized place right in the colonial imaginary. And there were lots and lots of herds of wild cattle. And this supported an alternative economy based on contraband, the contraband sale of cattle hides. And it really was a big threat to the Spanish colonial order on the island to the extent that they basically organized these scorch and burn campaigns and sent like, you know, people on horses to the north to burn everything down and empty that place of people, right? So it was this logic of extermination and depopulation. 
So I think taking into account both of these aspects of cattle, how on the one hand they can assist with colonial expansion and capitalist expansion through um, um, assisting with the establishment of private property as um, themselves being transformed into capital, right, on the one hand. But on the other hand, you know, they can support um, kinds of societies, they can support forms of local autonomy that challenge these colonial orders and that challenge state power. And you see examples of this in Mexico um, throughout the colonial period, in Argentina, also in the 18th and 19th centuries. And I think that for me, when I'm thinking about how we can move beyond these colonial legacies and how we can start to build something that is truly different with, and that does not reproduce these kinds of patterns that are based on a white supremacist order, that are based on racism, that are based on the control of humans and the similar control and isolation of plants and animals through the um, modern beef industry, right? Um, I think that these possibilities uh, that cattle present in the historical record um, might be starting points or might be added to the conversation, right? I think that this history gives us ideas about how to build different economies, how to build different ecologies, um, alternatives that recognize interdependency among different species. Cattle do not work on their own. They're working with grass. They're working with the flora and the fauna in the area. Um, alternatives that support also indigenous and black pursuits of freedom from colonialism in its many, many manifestations, including the manifestation that it has today. So those are a few thoughts and I uh, look forward to continuing the conversation in the Q&A. Thank you so much, those are good thoughts. I knew I was gonna learn a lot today, thank you so much. And now we're gonna um, turn to Liz in her book, oh, you can't see it, Healing Ground. Here's the book. I promise I read it for real. Um, Liz, I wanted to ask you, following up on this idea of extractive agriculture, the excitement around regenerative farming, I wonder if you could tell us about your book, um, about approaching it, the way that agribusiness has sort of co-opted the concept of regenerative and turned it into sort of a technical trick. Your book is different, and obviously, and it approaches um, a holistic way. I like the way that you talk about diversity in humans, diversity in nature, and how that can be um, drawn together in, in how we grow food in our food system. So just kind of, if you can tell us about your book. Thank you so much for the, for the invitation to be part of this conversation. And I too am learning a, an amazing amount. So thank you for sharing your insights with me and with everybody on here, um, Rosa and Linda. And much of what you said is, is really, really resonant for me. And particularly, I think the focus on land and power as the key things to be aware of in terms of what it really means to pursue regeneration. So when I was um, starting to research this book, I was noticing that there was a lot of excitement about the idea of regenerative agriculture. Um, and I'll include myself among the excited. <laughs> uh, the idea that agriculture could shift from something that was very extractive to something that was healing and regenerative for people and land. But I also noticed that people in the, in the research community, colleagues that I admired, had very different estimates of just how many carbon emissions they thought this regenerative agriculture could actually draw down. So there were some folks who said we could maybe do 20 to 35% emission reductions through these regenerative practices, which sounds awesome. And like, this should be a really key part of any sort of climate policy. And then there were other folks who said, eh, it's probably less than 5%. And we should really just focus on the energy sector and other things, because this is really more kind of greenwashing by big food or pipe dreams. So I was really curious, like, what's the truth, you know, are we, are we under 5% of, of emissions reductions with this strategy or is it actually like maybe a third of emissions that we could offset? And so, you know, as, as <laughs> just as you were saying, Jennifer, what I found was that not everybody means the same thing by the term regenerative agriculture. So there definitely are things out there that are being presented this way that aren't actually regeneration in its deepest sense, that aren't really tackling the extractive logic at the heart of the food system, but are more kind of trying to keep business as usual going on, but 
uh, let's add a little no-till or a few cover crops. So that isn't going to solve the climate crisis, obviously. But at the same time, um, to build on what you were just saying, Rosa, I heard from so many people within indigenous communities and communities of color who were pursuing regenerative agriculture, some using that, that term, some using other terms, building on these ancestral traditions, this ancestral knowledge, things that, that their communities had been practicing for hundreds, thousands of years in some cases, and that also had been honed, just also to build off what you were saying, as strategies of resistance and survival in the face of colonial and extractive agriculture. And when I started talking to some of these folks, um, you know, folks, um, who, who were continuing the legacy of agroforestry within the Black diaspora, folks continuing the legacy of the milpa and polycultures throughout the Americas, uh, folks continuing the legacy of nutrient cycling practices that have thousands and thousands of years of history on the Asian continent. All these folks, you know, sort of bringing these practices into the communities where they were um, and also in, in these brilliant ways, utilizing them um, as, as a strategy of resistance and survival. And those were the kinds of strategies that I saw as having the power to meet the challenge of climate change at the scale of the problem, because they went to these root causes of colonialism and extraction. And as, it, as you were saying, Rosa, this sort of separation of the relationships that land is between people and plants and animals to this healing, this reconnection of those, those mutually beneficial relationships. And mostly I talk to people who, who are in relationship with plants, but in the first chapter, I spoke with Latrice Tatsy, who's a member of Blackfeet Nation in Northwest Montana, and an ecologist who studies the relationship between bison and bison grazing and soil and soil carbon sequestration. And in my conversations with Latrice, what really stuck with me is, whereas in a lot of the regenerative grazing conversation, we hear about native herbivores as some kind of conceptual model, as some kind of static historical example that contemporary cattle producers can draw on to inform how they're gonna rotate their cows, Latrice, really emphasized that bison are a relative. You know, Blackfeet people and many, many other indigenous peoples of the plains have been in relationship with these relatives since time immemorial. And they're not just some kind of static um, conceptual model. They need to come home to their homelands. They have a role as a teacher and they need to be reunited with the native peoples that they've been in relationship with, the lands they've been in relationship with. In some cases, the practices of burning they've been in relationship with for that whole landscape to be whole. And that includes, you know, again, to draw off what you were saying, Rosa, um, you know, native folks who are cattle producers who have who have adopted this as a strategy, um, I think in many of the same ways as you're describing, um, she, Latrice talked about how having bison back on the landscape as a teacher can inform what to do with these settler organisms that are within communities that people have also developed cultural relationships with. If those bison are there as a teacher, not just in concept, but actually in presence, um, that that that's a really powerful form of indigenous land sovereignty that involves both the people and the native herbivores. And it's just an entirely different thing um, than if you talk about it as just a conceptual model and you do sort of nothing about the land justice issues or the power issues. Thank you so much. I wanted to ask also, before I follow up on that question, um, would you see a definitional difference between the concepts of agroecology and regenerative grazing. Um, and I, I would ask you that specifically for you. Well, I'm, I'm sort of trained in the field of agroecology. So um, those are my people. And I love that lineage. I love that community. Um, I appreciate how explicit agroecology is about these connections between ecological issues and social issues. And, and the rootedness of agroecology and social movements, and very specifically the resistance in Mexico and much of Latin America to the imposition of an extractive, um, you know, export-oriented colonial agriculture. And, and that was actually a story that I went into a little bit in the book um, in one of the earlier chapters. I'm interested in actually investing the term of regenerative agriculture with that, that deeper meaning because, 
I think that if you take the concept of regeneration seriously, it brings you to agroecology. And it excites me that there are so many people thinking about regeneration. I hope that's the first step on a path that leads to a really deep place. Because to me, the word regeneration, it, it asks the question, what's been harmed or extracted or damaged? And what would it actually take to heal, to repair? Um, I'm interested in those questions. And so I'm hopeful that that term can maybe lead us to ask those questions. Um, but you're absolutely right. There's, there's folks out there using the term who don't necessarily always mean that. Yeah, that makes the conversation typical. Thanks so much. Um, so I guess I, I want to ask, I want to follow up what you were talking about, Bison, and see if anybody had any anything else they want to talk about in terms of how the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, connect a crisis of food justice, land equity, and sovereignty movement. So you talked about how Bison are relatives and the whole the whole way we envision how we are living with the earth. Are there other connections that you see between? the biodiversity crisis um, and these issues that I'm asking, because often I see people talking about, again, regenerative grazing or even broadly regenerative farming, promoting biodiversity. And everybody means something different by that as well, by biodiversity and nature. Either it's, you know, we have more birds over here or they truly mean an intact ecosystem um, or they mean native grasses and restoration. What, is, what does this mean for you? How do you see food justice, biodiversity crisis, and climate crisis interacting. If that question makes any sense to me. Yeah, I, I'm eager to hear what Rosa and Linda have to say about this. I'll just say quickly that I think this idea of being in reciprocal relationship with land and the full land community is, is really powerful. And that's the, this, I think the, those are the right questions to ask is, um, you know, essentially, are we as people integrated into these relationships with our non-human relatives in ways that are a sort of mutual cycle of giving and giving back? And we can certainly see over the course of generations, whether that's true or not, or whether ultimately we are extracting over time and you know, not taking care of our relatives in a sense. So I think um, being in relationship with land over multiple generations gives you the opportunity to observe whether those things are in balance. Um, and that's, that's why I think land justice and land sovereignty are so important to this conversation because, um, you know, so often some of the shallower metrics of, of what biodiversity restoration means, as you pointed out, may not be enough. They may sort of be more of a, you know, an offset perspective. We're going to do this over here to try to make up for this thing we're doing over here that's deeply extractive. And, you know, things like fossil fuel development, for example, they're just, they're just totally inconsistent with the health of land. And so I think that perspective of the reciprocal relationship over multiple generations forces us to be more honest about what it actually takes to be in a good relationship with land. Any other thoughts? Okay, but just following up on that then, I wanna talk about land equity. I hear a lot of people, and especially regenerative grazers, for example, describe themselves as stewards of the land. Um, and they will go to all different kinds of countries sometimes and will, you know, stake their roots down there and they were, you know, they purchased this land that is maybe occupied land. Um, and of course, while we have black indigenous people of color, regenerative farmers, of course, broadly speaking, land equity is not there in the United States, for example. So it's a question of like, how are we working towards justice within these models of capitalism? If it is, if the land access to land is not equal, right? So how can we have, how can we build restorative justice? I don't want to say without access to land, but obviously that's going to play a big role in it, right? So practical terms, how do we get there? What are some steps that we can take or that we have to take? What are your thoughts on land back movements? This is for everybody, please. And, and how do we get to how do we get this to be more of a, the part of the conversation? Maybe it is in in the circles that you're moving in, but you know, in the work that I'm doing, it isn't. It isn't part of the conversation. It's just this is the land that I own. My family has owned this for generations, and 
I'm going to graze cattle here. And we don't, you know, we don't go into that deeper level of, of access to food, access to land, restorative justice, relational um, connections to nature. Do you have any, you know, insights on that and what you think we need to do? I think it's really complicated for so many reasons. There are, you know, so many ecologic, uh, economic sort of logics at play um, and at stake in this kind of thing. Ideas about property and what that means and what you should do if you have private property that relate to your question about access and also the meanings that people attach to landscapes and cattle and ranches, which you know can inspire very emotional responses and people can really love a certain kind of landscape um, without necessarily acknowledging the colonial history that shaped it, right? And the same thing can be said about food. There are these very deep emotional attachments to the food that people eat, even though there is this also very violent history. So it's I think that there are many aspects of it and they're all interconnected, but you know, I think it's we have to look at it from all of these different angles, right? The economic angle, the social angle, the cultural angle, the historical angle. Um, to try to build these connections, right? And to try to encourage people. I think that's that's at least what I try to do is to try to encourage people to identify and appreciate and acknowledge these bigger systems and how they fit into them and how through these systems they are connected to other people in very different ways and who are in very different situations. Yeah, and I think that could be an uncomfortable conversation to have, right? To talk about histories and land ownerships and inequity. And um, that's probably a good indicator that we need to talk about it. That level of discomfort needs to be worked out and, and addressed, of course, in policy solutions as well. Um, Okay, well, then I want to connect then to something else I want to talk about in terms of how we're imagining a relationship to the land and regenerative grazing, regenerative agriculture more broadly. What we often don't talk about, whether it's our metrics in terms of climate, water pollution, biodiversity, human impact, animal impact, wildlife impact, is slaughter, right? So ecologically that has an, an impact, you know, a regenerative system, the animal wouldn't be removed. Um, theoretically, in terms of it would regenerate into the ground, but also it takes an enormous amount of water. Um, but there's history of who was working in the slaughterhouses, which are historically, currently, the most dangerous inhumane places to work. Um, and often the people who work in slaughterhouses are immigrants or black indigenous people of color as well. And there's, of course, as we all know, I hope, endless human rights violations, right? So we need to have intersections when we think about this in terms of, that's one aspect of food justice and justice work um, to connect humans and the environment and not human animals and so forth. And I'm, I, I wanna ask Linda, if you can talk about some of these connections and some of these issues in relation to your research on slaughterhouses. Yes, um, I, again, I'm really enjoying this, this language of restoration of connection because it's it's so important to all of these um issues and when we talk about the slaughterhouse it's equally as important because there's such detached spaces we know that you know the slaughterhouse was intentionally moved away from the population so that it would be invisible and so uh that people wouldn't have to your average person wouldn't have to engage um, the sights, the smells, the sounds, and the really the violence that takes place in these spaces. Um, my work related to the slaughterhouse uh, involves the migration of Central American migrants. And so um, uh, most of my work deals with this uh, movement of people out of Central America through Mexico, um, through the borderlands, and then eventually into the US. And so, um, you know, it, it's 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 very interesting because Central America itself has become a complete site of production for you know it's an agro export historically, and so you're just exporting a bunch of food, and people have worked in that, and then as you know, um, different policies and neoliberal economic policies have taken over, they've shifted a bit of the economics into more of these sweatshop dynamics, if you will. 
Um, and so, so these are really kind of the only spaces to work and they're, they're limited. Everyone else is kind of pushed into informal types of um, work. And when that's not available, most of the options are to move, either migrate within the region or migrate out. And that's uh, on top of the deeply problematic social problems that are that are going on in Central America, the violence um, per se that, that people, it's just intolerable to live in. Um, so as um, people move through, they're met with you know, systemic violence through the whole journey from Central America all the way through, through into the US. And so um, what I did was talk to slaughterhouse workers um, in Ohio who were mostly working at case farms at a chicken slaughter. And a lot of these individuals are, um, were Guatemalan and indigenous. And so they not only have to face the violence of the migration process and the violence of then entering a space, the United States, where they become illegal bodies, um, but they're also uh, um, entering a space in which they, don't, you know, Spanish, for example, is English is not necessarily something that they speak and Spanish is not their first language either. Um, so their the communication and their um, level of accessibility for advocacy of, on their own account becomes very difficult. And a lot of these individuals I spoke with ended up working in the slaughterhouse, usually because of some kind of connection, right? So these migrant hubs, um, in certain areas and you have an ant that works in the slaughterhouse and then ant says hey there's some work here and so they, you come and so i spoke to people as young as you know um 18 they were 16 when they first started they kept, came as un, um, unaccompanied minors and they end up working in the slaughterhouse at you know barely 16 um, and so that already starts to show you how the regulations in these environments, right? The, the, the way the slaughterhouse handles workers um, is very, you know, devastating and problematic, but it, it really relates to this concept of destruction and violence. The, the logic of the slaughterhouse is guided by the logic of destruction and the destruction of life. And so that means the destruction of animal life, that's the whole point, um, but also the destruction of the bodies and the minds of people that work in the slaughterhouse. And so that was um, really a, the crux of uh, what came out of this research was the just uh, devastating violence that people have to deal with in, in these slaughterhouses. And um, and the extreme dehumanization. And so we had, you know, I spoke with people who, um, you know, I'm sure people are familiar with, you know, what is involved, line speeds and all these kinds of things with, with slaughter itself. But as in this particular slaughterhouse, as people were getting injured, um, they were being, they kept telling me like, we were sent to the, you know, the, this, the hospital on the hill. And I was like, what is this hospital on the hill? So enough people said it that, you know, I went back and I was talking to the um, organization that works with the workers and said, by the way, can you tell me what the hospital on the hill is? I'm not sure what, what they're referring to. Turns out that that hospital was a vet. And so the um, uh, slaughterhouse, when workers would get injured, would send people to the vet veterinarian's office up on the hill. The vet would maybe, you know, do some ointment, try to patch stuff up and then send people on their way. And so, um, you know, this really, you know, it's, it's just, it's a terrible example of how completely dehumanized people are and how the system itself views um, people, right? Par particularly marginalized people. And in the case of migrants, stateless people, right? They have no advocacy anywhere. They're, they're not gonna be advocated for in the US because they're considered uh, undocumented, and they're definitely not going to be advocated by their home countries. Um, so the, the the lives of everyone involved are disposable and replaceable and um, have no value within the system. And we see that even up to COVID, right? Um, the amount of people that died in, in COVID in slaughterhouses and the treatment of workers uh, in slaughterhouses, you know, there was some stories about managers making bets about how many workers would you know catch COVID and die and you know this was a gain to them and so the the way um these individuals are viewed 
has a lot to do with the way that the slaughter system views life in general, just as a disposability. Um, and if anything, if any value is attached to it, it's simply for profit. And that usually comes in relation to the animals because the humans are in their minds replaceable. You know, there's this constant flow of migration. We can replace workers anytime we want. So um, it is it is a um, completely <laughs> terrorizing environment for, for everyone involved, human and animal. Thank you so much for sharing all that. Um... I'm really glad that you did. I appreciate that you did because I think a lot of times we separate ourselves, you know, in this, we, we know that industry is extractive and destructive and we're saying, we want better. Think of the people, think of the animals, think of the environment. And they're often not the same people calling for those things and conversations need to be more integrated. And I know with the regenerative, I don't know if you want to call it a movement, but regenerate, regenerative farmers and food production often want to show how different they are from the system. They say, we're not the big industry. Don't compare us to the big industry. And yet there's a lot of ways right now, at least in the United States, that they're still reliant upon parts of this industry, um, which is vastly interconnected. And slaughter is one of those ways. Slaughter is also the number one point source for nitrogen pollution, right? Which is this massive problem. So what is the solution to that? And I don't see enough conversation. So I really appreciate all three of you having this conversation where these elements are brought into conversation with each other. So if we're gonna be talking about reciprocal relationships and you know, how are we doing that in a profit model, that in and of itself, if you have suggestions, I would love to hear that. Um, but you know, these changes that we wanna to move towards, they're gonna to require uh, policy shifts. Um, they're gonna require cultural shift in, at least in our minds of, of how we're relating to each other about caring about the people that are impacted in this as well, um, the economy and so forth. And so it's also gonna require how a shift in how dominant white American culture views food and agriculture and people and animals and the environment. I'm wondering what it will take in your view, if you have any hope for that, um, to do that. What are the steps and what will it take and do you think it's possible? Um. I'll jump in. Um, if uh, well, again, that's why I really like this idea of connection because, you know, the, as terrible as the slaughterhouse is, so is farm work, so is farm farm labor, and so it also requires us to re envision how we labor labor in general and these labor hierarchical labor relationships. And um, I remember, you know, being at a, a, you know, at a conference once and somebody was talking about just a complete switch to veganic farming everywhere, just veganic farming everywhere. Um, and so the question is always for me, like, OK, so cool, you, you change the, the, the system in a way. Um, who's doing the labor on the farms? I just wonder. Right. Uh, and so if the relationship is still the same where it's exploitative, uh, where you're, the expectation is that a group of marginalized people are still going to be doing this kind of work, is, but just the system is slightly different, um, then we're still, I don't think we're, we're hitting the mark just yet, right? So this idea of com um, um, connection, community becomes so important because if we have no connection and again these these spaces even the you know farms farm labor it's they're outside of us right there we're not largely connected to them most people and so we don't know who grows our food we don't know um, we don't know anything about these people um, and so if we can start working on restoring those connections not just to um, uh, people, which is so important, but also, you know, in the ways Liz was talking about earlier, our connection to the land, our connection to understanding how these systems regenerate on their own, how, how they work, how everything works in connection with one another. Um, I think that's such a great thing to think about, uh, even, you know, even if it, it's, we envision it in the far future, it's just such a beautiful thing to think about. Um, and it's so necessary for us uh, on so many levels to make um, the kind of change that's needed for people to really live whole lives across the system. Thank you. I'm gonna turn quickly to 
some questions because the first, oh, there's several questions, Linda, um, about where people can read your work on slaughterhouses. They're very interested in that. Um, forthcoming. <laughs> it's like the favorite word. Uh, yeah, I'm, on the slaughterhouse uh, work, I'm working on um, a larger project. So uh, I was going to go back, but um, COVID affected a lot of things. So, but as for now, it, it's it's coming soon, I should say, to a theater near you. <laughs> you have presentations online, or two. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you. Yeah, there's some work on, online. Um, if you just Google, I guess me. I'm not sure how you found it, uh, Jennifer, but it's Linda Linda Alvarez and Slaughterhouse. I'm sure it'll come up. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you. And maybe a last question, I guess, um, it's just how we talk about this, because uh, I'm not going to read this whole question, but I, I get what you're, the gist of it, which is how do we continue to talk about these issues, relational, reciprocity, just equity, um, you know, talking about it, bringing Native people into conversations we have about Native food, that kind of thing. How we talk about this with people who are, for example, just so single-minded, think I'm just talking about fertilizer. I don't want to talk about agroecology. I'm talking about cattle genetics. I don't want to talk about land equity. You know what I mean? Is there a way that you think that you have to talk about these issues with people who are maybe narrowly focused on something? Um, any advice about how you approach that? Because people are very resistant. And the whole reason I'm so grateful for you all is that these conversations need to be had better. And I, you know, I think you've done such a wonderful job. So is there a way, do you have advice for other people and how that they present these sort of issues and the interconnection? How would you talk to someone who's uh, solely driven into biophysical science, for example? <laughs> Well, here's, here's one thought. Um, I've noticed in talking with ecologists who specialize in regenerative agriculture that people keep coming back to the theme of roots and the ecological importance of roots. And so, you know, roots exude five times more carbon than above ground sources of carbon from the standpoint of what gets stabilized in the soil. So from an ecological standpoint, they're absolutely essential. And so whether you're focused on things like reforestation or restoration of prairie or even annual cover crops. Um, ecologists keep coming back to the, the role of roots. Um, and so something that I talked about a fair amount in this book and in some of the presentations I've given is how are we supposed to sustain roots in the ground for years and years and years in rooted communities when there's this paradigm of uprooting if people are constantly being uprooted, we can't have these roots perennially in the ground. And that's that's been a little bit of a starting point, kind of starting with the ecological science. But then I also think, you know, people are complex and you never know sort of what intersections they might have with some of these stories. I've been really um, amazed actually by some of the message I, I've gotten from people who, who read something and wanted to connect with me and something about this conversation resonated with them. Um, so I, I am hopeful. Um, and also partly, you know, an extractive colonial mode of being on the planet is ultimately not good for any of us. There are some communities that are on the front lines that have seen these impacts first and foremost and worst. But for all of us, it, it is ultimately, I think, in our self-interest at some level. Um, and, and climate change, I think, makes this very, very clear that um, a factory farm based meat system, you know, which we're talking about here today, it just isn't sustainable for any of us. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think food is one of those areas where the intersections between the personal and the social and the cultural and the spiritual just comes to play so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think the questions that we have now yeah some of the questions are about ecological impacts <clears throat> what we do what do we do if we remove all of the cows from the landscape i don't think that's what anybody here is proposing necessarily so um, i'm going to leave that by saying uh as i said at the top of the webinar uh, that we recently launched grazingfacts.com 
you can check that out. It's a great resource that we've built that might answer any of your questions. And of course, you can always contact me or continue the conversation on social media. And so thank you for all of our panelists, Linda Alvarez, Liz Carlisle, Rosa Fitzek, and please do check out their work. Our next panel will be on May 12th, the Decolonizing Regenerative Agriculture to Build a Just Food System. We're gonna totally continue this conversation talking about food justice, different ways we can actually talk about farming and food a little bit more with people who are farming. So I hope that you will find that interesting. Um, you can sign up on the links in the chat and yeah, thank you for joining us today. Thank each of you and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much.